There we go. Right. So welcome this evening. Hopefully you can see um, Father Richard and I up large on our screens and um, lovely to see you all and to have a really mixed and wonderful group here with us this evening. Um, we have uh, a little bit of time to discuss a topic that really takes a lot longer than one hour. Um, I mean, it's a topic that's been been discussed for 2000 years, so I don't think we're going to make much of a dent in it, but um, <laughs> thematically, it made a lot of sense. Chronologically, it made a lot of sense because not only are we less than a week from Passover, which begins next Saturday night, but it's also Passion Sunday and we're in the midst of Lent. And it's definitely the season in which our two traditions converge and from which they diverge, right? That key moment of Passover many, many years ago. And so it seemed like an appropriate time to um, just have a conversation that uh, Father Watson and I have very often um, and, uh, and have it with the opportunity to discuss a little bit with you all this evening. So we're each gonna share uh, a little text um, from our respective traditions, not very long, a few mm -hmm. minutes each. And then um, hopefully we'll open up for discussion. That's the idea is that we can actually kind of get some grasp of what the challenge of trying to talk about Jesus in two different traditions is. When I put this together, I titled it Rabbi Josh or Jesus Christ, which are two very different things. Um, but I guess the question is, how are they different? Why are they different? And uh, how can one individual kind of appear in such different ways? And um, maybe we'll get a little window into that this evening and uh, we'll require your help to do that. So I, I believe I'm going to start, if that's OK. I think so. And, and just on the back basis of you having a far better background than I have, I think... Uh, I defer to your aesthetic surroundings. Oh, well, it, it, it can't really attribute that to any particular skill other than having a good picture to download and put behind me. Um, but um, I, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, what, I, what I have here, hopefully everyone can see, are two, two texts, um, both from the Talmud, both from the Babylonian Talmud, both very short. And well, there are two of only literally a handful of texts in the Talmud about Jesus and about who he was and what went wrong, what I titled that at the top. That's what the rabbis of the Talmud, the rabbis that we call Chazal, right, the kind of founders of rabbinic Judaism, that's what they were concerned with, is where did things go astray? How did we end up with these two divergent traditions? What was the problem? They're kind of doing a uh, after hindsight, looking back consideration. So the first is a very brief story that um, doesn't make a great deal of sense, which is true of most things in the Talmud. And uh, I'm going to read it, but what I want to point out, hopefully what you can see here, is that the Talmud itself is a very terse text. It doesn't have a lot of information in it. A lot is missing. So when you look at this, the pink text or the red text, depending on your screen, is what's actually <laughs> in the Talmud. That's the direct translation. And the white is all there by a modern commentator to make it make sense, to fill in the gaps, to make it make sense. But if you only read the pink text, which I encourage you as we read it to just look at that and see what it makes out it to be, it's quite confusing because you don't really have enough information to put the story together. So this is a, a small story from the tractate Sota, which has nothing to do with Jesus. But as usual, the, the Talmud is taking a, a, a divergence and a tangent, probably actually a tangent on top of the tangent. And it it's, tells the following story. When he came back to Eretz Israel, that's the land of Israel, Rabbi Yehoshua arrived at a certain inn. The innkeeper stood before him, honoring him considerably, and overall they accorded him great honor. Let me get our setup. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Parachia, that's our protagonist, then sat and was praising them by saying, how beautiful is this inn? Jesus, the Nazarene, one of his students, said to him, My teacher, but the eyes of the innkeeper's wife are narrow. We'll come back to that. Rabbi Hoshua ben Parachia said to him, Wicked one, is this what you're engaged in, gazing at women? He brought out 400 shofarot and excommunicated him. That's our first half. Now, I'm going to read it again, but read just the pink parts to demonstrate how little sense it makes without the interpolation. When he came, arrived at a certain inn, stood before him, honoring him considerably, they accorded him great honor, sat and was praising. How beautiful is this inn? Jesus the Nazarene, my teacher, eyes are narrow, said to him, wicked one, is this what you're engaged in? He brought out 400 chauffeur and excommunicated him. 
That sounds a bit ridiculous, but that's actually what the, the Aramaic text above, it says, right? There's a lot missing in trying to understand the text. So you note in the white, how much is being filled in, what the relationship is between different aspects of it, what certain things mean, what the setting is, none of that's actually there. So we have to take it with a grain of salt. We need it there in order to read it and for it to be understandable, but it's not actually there. And obviously the key thing centers on this phrase, where Jesus seems to contradict his teacher, Yehoshua ben Prachia. It's one of the well-known rabbis of the period. His teacher, Yehoshua, is saying, how beautiful is this inn? And Jesus contradicts him, so it seems, by saying, but the eyes are narrow. Now it's in the, the feminine, true tote. So that's why they read it as the innkeeper's wife, that it's about a woman's eyes. But that itself is quite a big stretch. And true tote also doesn't mean narrow per se. It also means crying or something dripping and implies perhaps that there's something wrong with her eyes or that she's crying. Could be any number of scenarios, right? This is not an easy or straightforward scenario that we're reading. Whatever it is that Jesus says, it clearly upsets Rabbi Yehoshua ben Parachia, who rebukes him saying, is this what you're engaged in? Now the interpolation assumes that it's about him looking at the innkeeper's wife, but that's not actually what it says. And as a result, he brought out 400 shofarot, those are the ram's horns that we blow, and excommunicated him. He put him in cherem. Okay, now we see the second half of the story. Every day, each and every day, Jesus would come before him, but he would not accept his wish to return. One day, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Parache was reciting the Shema when Jesus came before him. He intended to accept him on this occasion, so he signaled to him with his hand to wait. Jesus thought he was rejecting him entirely. He therefore went and stood up a brick and worshipped it as an idol. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Parachia said to him, return from your sins. Jesus said to him, this is the tradition that I receive from you. Anyone who sins and causes the masses to sin is not given the opportunity to repent. The Gemara, that's the Talmud, explains how he caused the masses to sin. And this is obviously a later narrator editor. For the master said, Jesus the Nazarene performed sorcery and he incited the masses and subverted the masses and caused the Jewish people to sin. Quite a harsh treatment in many ways here. And it all relates to a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding is after he had this falling out with his teacher, he would come back every day asking him to accept him back. And actually this one day, the day in question, the teacher intended to welcome him back, but he was in the middle of reciting the Shema a prayer which cannot be interrupted by any speech. So if you're reciting the Shema, you're not allowed to stop and talk. In fact, the rabbis say that if you're in the middle of reciting the Shema and a snake bites your ankle, you still have to finish it. You can't stop and cry out in pain. So what Rabbi Yehoshua was trying to say is, hang on a second and I'll be right with you. But evidently the Talmud imagines that Jesus interpreted that hand sign as further rejection. And that was the final straw. And then he went off, what we say in Hebrew, went off the derech. Right, off the path. He went uh, astray. Very unfair in many ways and not reflective of all of other traditions of Jesus, but it's a good indication of what the rabbis imagined the problem was. Right, The problem was a student who was at odds with his teacher, who with whom he had several misunderstandings about things he said, about things that weren't said. It's a tragic outcome. Right, This is a series of misunderstandings that lead to a tragedy. And that reading of it that I've suggested that is about tragedy is really reinforced by the other place in the Talmud where the same story is referenced. It's in a different tractate entirely, Sanhedrin, as you can see here. And here's the statement there said in the name anonymously of the sages. The sages taught, always have the left hand drive sinners away and the right draw them near so that the sinner will not totally despair of atonement. This is unlike Elisha who pus pushed away Gehazi with his two hands. If you know that story, it's uh, Elisha, the prophet, had a kind of a, a student, an intern prophet, and uh, Gehazi kind of went a little bit off, off the path and got a little corrupt, and Elisha totally freaked out on him, and he got way worse, and he totally left, and it's also seen as a tragedy by the rabbis. He caused him to lose his share in the world to come, is the interpolation. This is also unlike Rabbi Hoshua ben Parachia, who pushed away Jesus the Nazarene with his two hands. So the criticism here is clear of Rabbi Yehoshua ben Parachia. The sense is that uh, there was a missed opportunity with Jesus as a rabbi and Jesus as a student, that if his teacher had been slightly more understanding or slightly more compassionate, then he could have brought him back into the fold. 
And instead, because he was a little bit too harsh on him, he drove him away. And that's why the problem, they see it, the problem uh, was created of a schism between these two different communities. It's a very personalized version of the story. It has nothing to do with the apostles, nothing to do with the Romans, nothing to do with the persecution of Jesus or his followers, the movement that followed him. It's simply about a conflict between two individuals and a series of misunderstandings that lead to a tragedy. It's an interesting and alternative look at, at this question. It's one of many that the rabbis put forward. But I think when we're thinking this evening, and we'll say more about it, um, on what exactly the image of Jesus is in these two traditions and how it is they diverge, that these two texts from the Talmud are a good place to start. But I believe Father Richard has a, a place for us to continue. So I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, certainly. Well, I, I think that in itself is uh, opens a fascinating window for, for most people coming from the Christian tradition, because obviously what we are presented with is an image of Jesus in the Gospels where Jesus uh, is an isolated individual. Um, and so the whole concept of Jesus having a teacher uh, is, is a whole um, area of uh, experience and influence that probably most Christian people don't give consideration to it's almost as if uh the, the character of jesus has got his own spin-off netflix series uh which is the gospels so you know there's this whole breadth of of a story but what we've got is the little spin-off bit that that focuses on a particular context and a, and a particular part of his life so the gospels um the, the image we have in the gospels is, is a very limited period of uh, probably a three-year period in Jesus life from the age of about 30, the last three years of his life. Um, and there are various uh, questions that are asked about what, what was he doing before then? Um, when, when the church uh, closed the canon of, of the New Testament, it, it rejected a number of other very dodgy documents or what were considered to be very dodgy uh, because they tried to fill in the gaps of, of Jesus' childhood. Um, but being left with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John gives us four different um, ways of looking at, at the life and ministry of Jesus. But it is a very small uh, section of, of that life. And of course, the, the text that we've just looked at uh, potentially open a window into to seeing Jesus before we are introduced to him in the Gospels, um, which I think really is it gives us a richness of um, and a roundness of character that, that we don't necessarily have just by looking at our own texts. Um, I thought I'd bring this evening two texts from Mark's gospel. Um, we, we've had uh, a number of study groups going on uh, during our weeks of Lent. Uh, and one of those that's been meeting on a Monday has been looking more closely at Mark's gospel. Mark is the earliest of the four gospels to be written. Uh, and of course, most People, a lot of people labour under the, in, the, uh, the impression that Matthew must have been the earliest because it comes first. Um, but the New Testament's put together in a very confusing way. Um, so Mark is the earliest. And in fact, the letters of Paul, uh, which are placed later in the canon of the New Testament, are actually the earliest writings of uh, the Christian period. But Mark is the earliest of the four Gospels. It's also the shortest. And it's also the one which has the, the plainest and simplest picture of who Jesus is uh, and certainly raises more questions than answers in terms of who Jesus considered himself to be. So I'm just going to try and share my screen, um, which hopefully has happened. Yeah, yeah. Can see. Uh, hey, right. It's good. So um, <clears throat> zoom in a little bit, maybe, because it's quite narrow. Uh, yes. Yeah. Let me see if I can do that uh no why is it not let me do that view under view under view uh yeah just pause while we have a little microsoft <laughs> uh, tutorial I, I think there should be uh yeah yeah zoom 100% oh, no, that's less right there zoom there we are right page width page width that's yeah, do it. oh look at that brilliant oh brilliant Whoa. so um so Mark chapter 11 uh, picks up the narrative uh, on what we call Palm Sunday, which is not this Sunday, but next Sunday, where Jesus enters Jerusalem. Uh, and the story is known as the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But um, one of the things we've been considering on a Monday night is that it's not quite as simple as that. So uh, I'll just read the text for you um, quickly. 
when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on, on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when they had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Uh, the passage continues, which I'll come back to in a moment. But what we've been thinking about is the, the wider context of this passage and of this event. Mark is very sparse in, in what he describes. Um, and of course, he doesn't give us any background information. Mm -hmm. So we've had uh, in the previous chapters of Mark, uh, the, the context is that Jesus is ministry in Galilee. Um, so a, a peasant teacher among peasant followers. Uh, they are not, um, the, the Mark doesn't give us any sort of background information other than that. So they then travel to Jerusalem. Clearly, this is something which has been planned. Jesus sends two disciples ahead of them uh, in order to make sure things are ready to procure the transport for the occasion. Um, and in, in the Christian tradition, and particularly because of how we, we treat this on Palm Sunday in our liturgy, uh, it's very much a, a display of how Jesus is, is a king, but not of this world. It's Jesus showing his humility and his meekness uh, and coming into Jerusalem at the beginning of this tumultuous week. We've been following the work of uh, two New Testament scholars, both of which uh, have a degree of notoriety. Uh, one is John Dominic Crossan, who's a Roman Catholic scholar who's been banned by the, by the Vatican, which just shows that he's really quite good. Um, and and he, he tends to overturn a lot of stones uh, and looking very critically at the, the texts of the Gospels. The other is a Lutheran scholar, Marcus Borg, who again uh, looks at the text of the Gospels, trying to strip away the assumptions that we bring to them. And of course, we, we bring to these stories uh, the richness and sometimes the complications of 2000 years of Christian theology, of Christian art, uh, and Christian liturgy, all of which is a, a sort of layered upon layered, uh, the embellishments to the story. So without a doubt, when we read these texts, we come at them with a number of theological assumptions, but also we, we fill in the story from other parts in the same way that in the text that, that uh, Adam's just shared with us, you have to fill in the meaning in order to make sense of it. We bring so much uh, interpretive meaning to these texts that sometimes it's hard to see what's there. And so just the simple point that Jesus has clearly planned this event makes a difference. This is not a spontaneous, uh, over, overwhelming arrival in Jerusalem and being heralded by the people. In fact, the, the reality is that for most people in Jerusalem, this would have gone unnoticed. Not least because what was uh, in the understanding of these two scholars anyway, and I think backed up by other scholarship, what was common is that because uh, the Roman presence in Jerusalem needed to be increased and heightened around all of the festivals, but especially at Passover, there would have been another pre procession into the city that week, if not even on the very same day. Pontius Pilate, as the Roman governor, was stationed at Caesarea Maritima over on the coast. And so just as Jesus is approaching the city from uh, Bethany through the Mount of Olives uh, in through, um, I think now would have been what we call the Golden Gate. On the other side of the city, in order to get to the Antonia Fortress on the, the edge of the temple precincts, Pilate would have come with his retinue. And of course, there would have been no humility there. Now, these scholars are suggesting that Jesus was quite deliberately 
lampooning the imperial procession uh, at, at Passover time. So Jesus is deliberately setting up a situation where he is coming in to, to show himself as an alternative to the, the oppression of Rome. So he's not making any kind of statement about Jerusalem as a city, about himself as a rabbi, other than that he is opposed to the, the imperial oppression of uh, Jerusalem and, and of Israel. So to see Palm Sunday as not, not just as a, a beautiful picture in our, our Sunday school uh, sticker books, which uh, many of us in the Christian tradition have grown up with, but it's actually giving him a, a theological and a political context, uh, which, which other, otherwise he's just not, not noticed. But it's a very different thing to imagine Jesus bringing his disciples into Jerusalem to make a political statement against the Roman oppressors. So that's the first um, sort of iconoclastic smash that we've been looking at uh, this Holy Week, uh, this Lent. The passage goes on, um, which is possibly a much more misinterpreted incident in the life of Jesus uh, when he causes a riot in the temple. And it's, it follows on in Mark chapter 11. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, we'll come back to that in just a moment, um, because that, that is a, a, a striking for its petulance and unreasonable unreasonableness that Jesus curses a fig tree because it, it is rude enough not to bear figs out of season in order to satisfy his hunger. But this is not uh, this is where we need to pay attention to what Mark is doing when he constructs his gospel. He then goes on to tell the story. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So very briefly, and Adam, you'll need to tell me to stop because otherwise I will just keep I, going. I have, I, have, I have some questions about this. Actually. OK, all right. Good. Go uh, on. Good. I might not have any answers, but uh, <laughs> but the, so there are two stories here which mark um, sandwiches together. There's the story of Jesus going into the temple uh, and in uh, our sort of um, our way of titling events. This is normal, normally called uh, the cleansing of the temple. Now, even just by calling it the cleansing of the temple, we are we are overloading that with an interpretation because there are no titles, uh, there are no subject headings uh, in the gospel texts. So we are we are interpreting this by calling it the cleansing of the temple. So the the implication is that there's something impure there that needs to be cleaned up and something which needs to be swept away. But but Mark is is linking that with this story of the, the fig tree. And in both stories, you have a, an image of Jesus as being rather petulant, um, acting a bit like a spoiled brat, you know, cursing the fig tree for not being what he wanted it to be and providing it with figs and causing havoc in the temple. Now, what the, the uh, Crossan and Borg um, sort of say in the way they approach this text is that Mark is deliberately giving two stories which laid side by side help us to interpret the other because it is completely unreasonable for Jesus to expect a fig tree to bear figs out of season. 
Um, and and so what what they're doing is providing a visual. What Mark is doing is providing a visual key to how to interpret the text of what's going on in the temple. Now, equally so, it is completely unreasonable for Jesus to behave the way he has done in the temple, because as far as I'm aware, there was nothing going on in the temple which was not authorized and and was part of the everyday temple business. So Jesus is not making a judgment about whether money was changing hands in the temple. Now, of course, for centuries, this has been used as an argument about why churches should not run coffee shops and, and uh, bookshops and, and, and why trading should be not happening on, on Sundays. Um, but, but it's a complete misappropriation of this text simply because there is no understanding of its Jewish context. Mm. So Jesus is, is fueled by... The, the, one of the questions we've been looking at, which is very clear in Mark, is why did Jesus do what he did? Why did Jesus teach how he taught? And you know, what was the passion of Jesus? Not in the sense of what was his suffering, which is the, the, the sort of um, the most common usage of, of the word passion. His passion is his suffering is, and his death. But actually, what was the passion that inspired his life? What was the passion that fueled his teaching and his commitment to, to push things as far as he did? And of course, his passion quite clearly in Mark's gospel is for the kingdom of God. So Mark doesn't waste any time telling stories about how Jesus was born. Uh, we have no uh, we have no Christmas story. There are no wise men. There are no shepherds. There's no star. Uh, there's none of that. Mark doesn't see that as important. What Mark tells us, the first thing he tells us is of a 30 year old man who is so consumed with a passion for the kingdom of God and the teachings of God that he begins his ministry. Now, interestingly, against the text that Adam has shared, maybe that was what happened after um, he, was, he was not allowed to come back. You know, maybe, maybe that's where the Netflix miniseries sort of spins off. Um, but, but Jesus, there's very little in Mark's gospel where Jesus makes any claim for himself to have any divinity. And this is one of the things sometimes called the, the messianic secret in Mark's gospel. But notably in Mark's gospel, any any suggestion that Jesus uh, has a, a divinity and a divine authority other than that of a teacher comes from the mouth of, of or, or comes from otherworldly sources. So when Mark describes the story of his baptism in the Jordan, it's a voice from heaven that says, this is my son mm -hmm. uh, with whom I'm well pleased. And very often when demons are cast out, they are able to identify him uh, as, a, as a divine character. Uh, it's never something which which the disciples certainly get round to to verbalizing, apart from Peter, who in, in Mark chapter eight, at Caesarea Philippi says, yeah, I've got it. You're the Christ. But then within a hair's breadth, he's, he's getting it completely wrong again. And Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan. So. So there is no sense of, of the disciples having a formed Christology. But the important thing about the story in the temple, and I, I'll, I'll shut up after this, um, because it, it, it just shows how Jesus is so steeped in uh, the teaching of the prophets. What Mark presents to us is uh, a, a teacher who is um, absolutely consumed with a passion for the kingdom of God and is presented in the style and character of the eighth century prophets. So Isaiah, Amos, Micah, Jesus is sort of in the same mold. Um, and there are two quotes, although it looks like one quote. So when Jesus causes this riot in the temple, he says, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? Quoting Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 58, uh, the way we have it, have it constructed in our Bibles. And it's about... The, the, the temple being a place for all people. Um, and of course, one of the things that, that Herod had done was extend the temple precincts to, to enable the court of the Gentiles to, to bring so many people uh, onto the Temple Mount. Now that's that's got inverted commas. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But the reference to a den of robbers doesn't have speech marks, but that is also a quote. And I think it's a quote from Zechariah or Zephaniah. I always get the two muddled up and I should have looked it up before I logged on. But Jesus is also quoting the eighth century prophets by referring to the temple as being a den of robbers. No, it's not. It's not those. It's Jeremiah. Sorry, it's Jeremiah. 
Um, and of course, the crit criticism of the eighth century prophets was that the temple had, had lost its way. Um, and that, that actually were calling the people back to God. So very, very briefly, and I will stop then, it, it is these two brief uh, chunks of Mark's gospel present Jesus as making two deliberate demonstrations. He comes to Jerusalem. He demonstrates against the political authorities by lampooning the procession of the, the governor into the city uh, when he's coming to, to keep the peace at Passover. And he also goes into the temple uh, and in the style of the eighth century prophets, um, criticizing the religious authority. Now, the reason that is important to grasp that, that he's, he's doing that against the political and the religious authorities is that what he isn't doing is saying all of this doesn't matter anymore. He's not saying that. He's not saying um, I'm here now. You follow me. Uh, we have a picture of Jesus uh, in the New Testament in Mark, which is very comfortable in his own skin as a Jewish teacher. So my very brief answer to the question of do we need to know Jesus in his, in, in his historical context as a rabbi, uh, the very quick answer, which I'm not very good at, as you'll see by now, is yes. Right. Um, we can't understand Jesus without understanding him in his Jewish context, um, because otherwise we misinterpret what we see before us. Thank you, um, Father Richard, and, and you're too harsh on yourself. But, um, but, but before we open it up, I think there's a lot to discuss here. I think a few things just looking at this, and I have to admit, I haven't spent that much time with the Gospel of Mark. Um, there is, by the way, a great, just a, a plug for a great uh, edition of the New Testament, which has got commentary by um, Jewish Bible scholars called the Jewish Annotated New Testament. Um, which Father Richard has handy. Um, and uh, do, do you want to take off screen sharing so we can... Oh, sorry, yeah. That's all right. So um, I think the thing I'd just like to say is that the both of these stories, to me, both from the Talmud and from, from the Gospels, are showcasing something that we do a poor job of understanding, which is the, the historical context of, of Judaism in that first century, especially the first half of the first century. If we're to believe Josephus, which is somewhat doubtful, but he's right on a lot of things, so we can believe him on this. There was really kind of two, we know there was two main divisions of Jewish people at the time. What were called in Hebrew, the Tzidukim, or the righteous ones, versus the Perushim, the separatists. Uh, you know them better perhaps as the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the, the Greek version of their names. And they were the two primary kind of quite at odds sects of Judaism at the time. The Sidukim being focused on the temple, drawn mostly from the priesthood, the scribal traditions, the hierarchy associated with Jerusalem aristocracy, and the Perushim, the separatists, being mostly rural, mostly in the backwaters of the Galilee, mostly kind of opposed to the temple on moral grounds and trying to create their own structures of Judaism without the temple. Um, Within each of those, there were then fringe extremist movements, as is often the case. This is a, a civil war, basically, that was going on for a long time. So the extremist Sadducees, who were obsessed with the temple and purity, were so obsessed with purity that they, they left the temple entirely and went out into the wilderness. And those are probably the kind of the remnants of what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls and other, other kind of separatist elements from the Sadducee side. But the, the separatists, which more concerns us in this case, on the Pharisee side, the Purushim, they had their own extremists, who the, we call the Kanaim, right? The passionate ones, the zealous ones, the jealous ones, depending on how you translate it. You, you use the word passion a lot. Mm. I think it's really interesting because the same word passion as zeal, um, but zealot has a negative connotation because yeah. that's what this group was called, the Kanaim. And they were basically extremist Pharisees um, who were so impatient to contest the Sadducees, the Sidukim, and so impatient to contest Rome's domination of Judea that they started taking up violence as a way to respond to it. And it was a big problem for the mainstream Perushim, who were trying to kind of thread the needle of resisting the Sadducees, but also providing a reasonable alternative that didn't lead to violence. And a lot of young men in particular, as is often the case in these situations, were drawn into the, the Kanaim. They were very kind of attractive guerrilla warfare out in the wilderness, most of them coming from the Galilee or from other backwaters and not Jerusalem. And I think you see that 
Jesus as an individual is trying to hold the tension between the mainstream Pharisees, who were his teachers, if we're to believe the account of the Talmud, versus the extremist um, Kanaim, the Zealots, who were mostly his students, right? A lot of his apostles are identified with nicknames that we know from Roman documents that were used for the zealots, right? Simon, Peter, the ones who were called Thunder, right? And Judas as well, right? Who is called Ish Kariot, but most likely that's a reference to him being one of the Sikari, right? One of the individuals who walked around with sickle-shaped blades assassinating people in the marketplace. These were extremist rabbis mm-hmm. who, who, who were so desperate for, as you say, the kingdom of God to arrive that they took it into their own hands. And Jesus is, is sitting there in that middle ground, it feels like, where his teacher, Yehoshua ben Parachia, a pretty conservative mainstream Pharisee, Perushim, who also doesn't like the temple, but doesn't want to respond to the same degree as Jesus does, is, is, is pulled and pushed. How should he deal with this kind of renegade, passionate young man? Should he pull him in? Should he push him out? And the Talmud judges him harshly, saying he pushed him too far, right? The better way is to rehabilitate him and bring him back in. But from the other point of view, we see Jesus talking to his apostles, who are more extreme than he is in many cases, trying to bring them back, saying, no, no, you don't need to do that. There's another way. And he's sitting in this middle spot that makes so much sense in understanding these texts that we've seen. Him quoting Isaiah, him coming into the temple and trying to just, you know, one man protest movement. You just imagine them there with a bullhorn trying to stop, you know, anything from going on in the temple. That's something any of the Purushim, including all of our Judaism's ancestors, would have also done. Uh, He was completely within the fold in that regard, maybe a bit more dramatic than some of the Purushim who were a bit more conservative but they would have agreed with him, right? These are the rabbis who were creating synagogues out in the wilderness because they couldn't stand the temple and the siduchim who ran it. So nothing that we see him do in that text is something that would be um, unusual for a, a Pharisee, a Purushim at the time. He's a bit intense about it, perhaps, but that maybe goes to show the fact that he's holding this space between the mainstream and the more extreme elements which were contesting at the time. After Jesus' death, by the way, the extremists went out. They eventually went out and in 66 provoke a civil war completely and are responsible for the destruction of the temple. Yeah. And and actually, one of the things about Mark's gospel is that that in terms of dating, when it originated, uh, it could could be as early as 45. um, Yeah, what we'd call AD, but 45 common era, um, or it could be as late as 90. But most likely it's either just before or just after the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. So, so the backgrounds, all of this is very much about political and religious uh, tension, um, intense persecution of, of Jews, but also of Jewish Christians as well. Um, so there, there's there's a whole sort of social and cultural mix behind the text as well, which is which which I guess sharpens different aspects about how the story is told. Hmm. Um, I mean, not, not least in, I mean, the disciples in, in Mark's gospel are, are all portrayed as being, you know, not necessarily as extremists, but as rather dense. You know, they, they are, they're not good disciples. They, they don't understand. They, they have to, you know, three times as they travel to Jerusalem, Jesus explains what's going to happen. And they don't get it. They they end up arguing over different things. Who's going to be the greatest? And all all, all those things. They they just fail to grasp what's going on. Hmm. Um, but of course, it's being told to a group of disciples who have been under severe persecution, many of whom have given up. So it's it's presenting a way a story of rehabilitation and, and renewal that even even these disciples are failing, um, but they can still be brought back uh, and restored to the community at the end of it. So I think that the historical background is crucial in understanding the the emphasis and the way the image of Jesus is cast, really. Hmm. It's, uh, I, I want to open up for other people because I know we have probably have some questions. Um, so I invite anyone to take themselves off mute and uh, give us a shout and uh, a perhaps unusual opportunity to get two different points of view on, on any question in this area. There's just so much to say. I mean, we're just really scratching the very surface here. And I think the main thing to say is there's a lot more work to be done in understanding this, but it, it does feel like there's a, um, a background which is there, which is poorly understood by both our traditions at times. Um, and the more we simply kind of look at what the sources say, the more obvious sometimes it is. So, 
um questions anyone anyone want to or, or thoughts or something that that you want us to uh to explore a little bit further in the time we have left this evening jackie i see your hand you're on mute Th thinking of um uh father richard uh where jesus says um the lord needs it talking about the cult yeah um this is what jesus is saying to the people who he sent to get the cult to say yes. the yeah. lord needs it who does he mean by the lord does he mean himself or does he mean god we well i mean that's open to interpretation of course but i i, I suspect uh, and don't forget what we're what we are reading is mark's telling of the story so so whether whether uh, how much of that is a word for word account um, and don't forget the gospels are all written uh, from a post easter perspective uh, so so that you know the, the christian uh, tradition had been growing already um, by then so so a lot is being read back but i i i think the assumption my assumption would be that that jesus is self identifying there uh, as as the lord um, but but it, it he could be referring to a, a greater sense of purpose that, that what I am planning, which, of course, the disciples don't know about. They don't know what's going to happen. Um, he plays his cards very close to his chest. And the same happens on um, the Thursday when they celebrate Passover. He sends someone ahead. Uh, the, the, the disciples don't know where they're going to be celebrating Passover. So he sends them ahead and he, follow a man, find the man carrying the water jar and he'll tell you where to go. So it's all very cloak and dagger. Um, but he could be saying what, what I'm going to do is for the greater glory of the Lord. So this is for the Lord. So I think it could go both ways. But I think the, the assumption would be that it, he was saying um, he I think the assumption would be he's self-identifying as the Lord. But that's me because I'm a Christian reading a Christian scripture. And of course, that's what it means. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it, I think it could be open to, to either, really. It definitely isn't language that would be uncommon for, for prophets. I mean, that, yeah. that sort of language, I'm sure you could find many analogies in the way that Moses speaks to others about his mission to say, oh, well, God wants this or whatever, where it's not obvious. We would never even assume that he's talking about himself. So, so much of it is what we think the text is going to say mm -hmm. before we look at it and how that yeah. informs us. Um, Beverly, I see your hand. Everyone's very nice in raising their hands. <laughs> Um, I don't really understand what uh, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Pariah's um, uh, problem was. Um, like, I don't understand what he he was angry about with with Jesus when he, Jesus complained about the innkeeper's eyes. Yeah, um, I don't either. Um, I, I think that it's it's so um laconic there's so much missing it's really hard to guess at what's going on the you know the the descriptions are i mean there's, there's other ways to potentially read that story there's many other ways if we take only what the text itself says it doesn't necessarily have to be about the innkeeper's wife at all because that's not in that's not in the text um it's about he says you know her eyes are 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 drooping are tearing up or whatever and um, that could be a reference to a variety of things and it's not clear why it provokes such a strong reaction from rabbi yehoshua but whatever it is it clearly is something that upsets him um i wonder i mean i i i think in the context it could be about a variety of of people or not a person at all and it could be a phrase an idiom that we're just not familiar with um, it could have been something about the animals. Maybe he was saying, oh, you know, the, we're working the animals too hard. We need to let them rest. Look, their, their eyes are drooping. And Rabbi Yehoshua is just saying, no, we got to go. Who knows, right? Like you could read it so many ways. And I think that's one of the challenges is that many of the texts we do have about Jesus, especially in the Talmud, they've been censored so often and they've been erased so often that what's left over is really, really, really confusing. And it's very unclear what's going on. Um, I think to some degree, it doesn't matter hugely. It's clearly not about ideology. Um, it's about an interpersonal conflict, right? That he kind of, he was aggravating his teacher and his teacher was short tempered and said, oh, you know, forget you, that's it. And the dramatic 
description that he pulled up 400 shofaro to excommunicate him is obviously ridiculous right well the, i was wondering where where did he kept them you know <laughs> were, they, were they in a backpack or <laughs> uh, it, it's absurd right like even even in the few instances we have of, of a court of Beit Din doing an excommunication they, they don't use 400 shofarot so it's clearly like a you know a narrator's note there an editorial note which meant to show the drama of his overreaction but the point of the story is that he overreacted whatever Jesus said was not actually that important and it's his overreaction that's ultimately the problem there were many many people like Jesus in the time of the rabbis. There were many young men who were influenced by the more radical streams of, of Purushim thought. There were many of them who were the rabbis. Some of them kind of, you know, managed to stay in the fold. Some of them went out of the fold. Some of them became famous and some of them didn't. And it's partially interesting to look at other people with whom a similar description is given because there were many who um, were identified as potentially the Mashiach. Because that language, right? That first text, Father Richard, that you brought, the language that Jesus uses would be very familiar to any of us if we translate into Hebrew. Hoshanana, right? B'shem Madonai, Bruchim Abayim, B'shem Adonai. That's what we say in the beginning of a wedding. Blessed is there are those who come in the name of God. Right? All of that are, all of those are quotes. And all of those are quotes which anyone who claimed that they were going to take political power would have used totally comfortably. And there's nothing there that indicates necessarily that Jesus was any different from any of the number of people who claimed that they were going to be the ones to solve the problem, bring peace and, and to bring power to the, the people. So it's interesting to see, um, to wonder at what went wrong, um, Beverly. And I think that there's a, a good chance that there's a lot missing from the story because it's been censored as well, which requires some manuscript work which I'm sure you might enjoy doing, maybe. Uh, Johnny, I see your, your little hand up there. Yeah, um, I just wondered, is there much crossover between the, the, these stories in the Talmud and the, the Christian writing, or are they two sort of completely separate pieces? Uh, I mean, clearly the, the fig tree story resonated quite a lot with, with me. Um, I'm, I think it was, I mean, I'm interpreting that as trying to make a bigger point. You know, the fig tree doesn't matter really. It's the, you know, the, the, the sort of powerful metaphor. Um, crossover, do we see that or not really? I think um, whatever's made Adam run away, it must be a very tricky question to answer, but I'll, uh, <laughs> um, I think the, I think there's a potential for a huge amount of crossover. And of course, in reality, the crossover is immense. But I think for, for most people coming from our respective traditions, it's not something we explore because our starting point, well, certainly I can say that for, uh, you know, so it, um, if you like, the, the, the Christians are the, the, the latecomers to this party um, in that we pick up a story partway through and make it our own in various ways now that that's that's how it is but i think we then have a responsibility to explore the overlap uh in a way that that reveals that there is an awful lot more that that we can do uh because we we actually think in in a similar way we act in a similar way we have a similar foundation but unless we unless we um strip away the arrogance of thinking that, that our starting point is the starting point and we don't need anything else, then it, it, we're blind to it. Can I, um, can I, can I add to that? Uh, actually, I think there's just as much problem on the Jewish side, um, different problems. There's a very defensive reaction to having these conversations in a lot of Jewish mm -hmm. communities because so many years of, of Christian persecution of Judaism has made a lot of Jews just react so negatively. And mm -hmm. it goes so far back. A lot of the rabbis of the time of the Talmud were defining themselves by their, by their opposition to Christianity. So everything that the Christian community started to make important in their lives, the rabbi said, oh, that's not our thing. But that's not also not true, right? I mean, yeah. the, the typical story or narrative that you'll hear a lot of Jews say is that, well, Judaism was going along just fine and then Christianity broke off, right? That it's a kind of sect. The reality is that's not what happened. 
right? The, the biblical temple-based Judaism was going along just fine. And then a huge cataclysm erupted in a hundred years and two, two things forked out of that. One of which was Christianity and one of which was rabbinic Judaism. And the reality is, although obviously, you know, there's a lot of things about Christianity as it develops, I think don't have much role in terms of Jewish context, almost all the things that are central in the gospels are Jewish things. They were at the time. The idea of a Messiah who would be a, an individual who would be ordained to take political power, that was a very Jewish thing. There was lots of people claiming that. The idea even of some kind of birth where there's some mystery about it or rising from the dead, also a very Jewish thing, right? There were lots of things circulating at the time in the Jewish community that Christianity actually wasn't going away from anything. It was just choosing certain things to emphasize and rabbinic Judaism choose other things to emphasize and they diverged. And you see that the further it goes on, the more space there is between those two accounts. And even in the time of the Talmud, a few hundred years later, and the time of the Gospels, however much later that might be, you see the divergence is growing in terms of how the story is told. But if you go back to the, to the first century itself, you see that there is, you know, like you said, it's a spin-off really, but reality, there was kind of the original series that everyone loved and that everyone, you know, had fan, there was fandom of equally. And then there was two different spin-offs that really changed. And that's hard for us to accept as well, because we like to think that actually we have the continuity but continuity is very hard to, to, to say when the first century was such a disaster. Mm. Well, and given that the Mark's gospel was the, the first gospel, and then uh, it compared that to John, which is the, the last, which was probably written about, uh, around 100, um, the, the, the gulf between the Jewish and Christian communities is so, um, so vast then, because it's, you know, the, 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 the Christians have, have really sort of moved away from the, the synagogue community. Um, and that, you know, without a doubt, the, the texts are anti-Semitic, you know, the, because that, that is the relationship behind the texts. Uh, it, it's the relationship of two communities which are now pitted against each other rather than uh, understanding that, that there was a degree of symbiosis. Hmm. Uh, David and Rand, I see your hand up over there in Wales. Um, yeah, I was very, more than a question, more a comment. Uh, many things have been already said, but it's really interesting the chapter uh, on Marx on the gospel that shows more Jesus with a certain inten intentionality uh, living the present moment that it was very complicated not, uh, at that time. And so it's very interesting because, um, yeah, there is a claim as it not uh, as been said on the text, but as well intentionality to say, oh, I'm doing that. So uh, I'm really surprised to discover this. And then the second thought that I thought, yeah, uh, it's crazy because both stories from the Talmud as well from the gospel, they talks about this, you know, the humans and not about the claims somehow. So it's very, I, I find very fascinating. So it was more a comment more than a question. So that's great. Yeah. And, and, and reading uh, Mark from a Christian point of view, that because the problem we have is that we've got the other three, the voices of the other three Gospels and all of Paul's theology, which is much more advanced than we find uh, in, in the terms of how he explains who Jesus is. But that's all sort of programmed in our heads. So we kind of don't notice that it's not there. Um, and so, you know, the, the, that, that kind of what surprised you really would surprise most Christians as well, ironically. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. That's really good. Um, Tina and Jeff, I see your hand up. I think that might be our last one. We're nearly at our hour here. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. I've really enjoyed listening to them. I just wanted to ask, um, Father Richard, you mentioned about this sort of social constructionism where we look at things laid through our cultural background, religious beliefs and upbringing and so on. Yeah. What's your perspective around... Um, uh, Christians who look back at the Old Testament and, and sort of claim that certain texts point towards Jesus? It, it's actually something we've been looking at on Monday evenings um, and we've been uh, looking at the what, what Borg and Crossan call prophecy historicized. So it's the sense of accepting that, that uh, the way the Gospels were constructed uh, was a you know so what what comes first one of my favorite questions asking people when they come uh, for uh, baptism or confirmation you know making a, an adult statement of Christian faith which came first the bible or the church 
Um, and of course, very often they say, oh, the Bible, because the church is founded on the Bible. And then you say, well, no, actually, the church came first because the church generated the texts. Uh, so you've got the sense that, that anything, any written text that we're dealing with has its roots and is embodied in a community of faith and a culture and all the, the hang ups that go with that. Um, so clearly what what happened, I think I say clearly, but, you know, the, the post Easter, post the experience of following Jesus, being taught by him, the things that the disciples witnessed, the things that, that emerged in their understanding of who Jesus was and, and what was going on in that whole experience after Easter, then sends them back to the scriptures to, to find uh, the evidence for what's happened. And so you get prophecies uh, which are you know, clearly uh, things which are in the what, what we would call the Old Testament, uh, which is a, a awful um, misappropriation. So we try and refer to the Hebrew scriptures as much as possible. Uh, so so we, the early Christian community was mining this treasure trove of, of imagery and um, statements and prophecies to find those things which fit, uh, which help them to tell the story of their own experience. Um, so so I, I think, uh, and, and this is particularly important around Easter, uh, and one of the things we've been trying to grapple with is this sense of why did Jesus have to die? Did God want Jesus to die? Uh, because if you say it was prophesied thousands of years before that it was going to happen, then there's an intentionality to that. You know, it must, you know, it must, it had to happen. So therefore God must have wanted it to happen. Well, you know, scriptures also tell us that God never wills the death of a righteous man. So that can't, both can't be true. So so it, it's a sense of, um, yeah, I think the, the, the Christian experience is to go back to the Hebrew scriptures and find the, the imagery and all those things which, which are there. And very often the, the, the prophecies, um, bearing in mind that prophecy is about forth telling before it's about foretelling. So prophecy is, is actually God speaking to his people and saying, this is it. This is, this is who I am. This is what I am. This is what I call you to. Uh, you know, that's much more what prophecy is about rather than predicting into the future about something that's going to happen or not happen. Um, so so the sense of so, yes, I think there are things which are well, so almost all the things that that are quoted by the New Testament writers from the Hebrew scriptures are things which have their own context separate from any Christian interpretation whatsoever. So I think there's there's a lot there that. That, that as as a Christian reader, we don't understand the depth of and the and the you know, like those two two quotes that, that Mark uses and Jesus says when when the incident's going on in the temple. You know, we just don't realise the, that they those very small sentences have a theological depth, uh, which gives us the key to understanding what Mark is trying to say, not what we think he's trying to say. That was a bit of a waffly answer. Sorry. No, it's, that's the nature. That's the nature of this evening. I think, in some ways, uh, you know, anyone who claims conclusive answers to these questions probably isn't telling the truth. So uh, I think it's wrong. <laughs> and um, you know, the the um, just just to kind of close this out, I think that actually, I, I don't know if we've gotten any closer to any answers, but I think it's clear that the discussion is one that's far overdue in some way because. Mm -hmm. You know, we both understand our traditions better through looking at each other, right? Certainly, I think that it's clear that Christianity can learn a lot from the Jewish context of Jesus's life and from his status as a rabbi. But I think it's also true that Jews can learn a lot from seeing what Christianity took from Judaism that we then said, forget about it. And maybe that wasn't fair either. Um, and maybe it's, it's there's a reappraisal there in some ways as well. So it's a very fruitful dialogue. It's only really a very fruitful dialogue because we have such a good partner in you, Father Richard and St. Saviors. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Well, and, and likewise, and uh, if anyone wonders, this is what we do during lockdown. We hang out on Bernard's Heath uh, like a couple of teenagers uh, <laughs> talking about these things huge nerd um and uh, and in some way we'll continue the conversation because we're going to be joining together at least for a, a a passover seder on the fourth night of passover next week it's a tradition i've really enjoyed the last few years getting to come to saint saviors and help lead 
uh, the past service data that you've done help bring it to a place that's more about cooperation and collaboration rather than exploitation. And I think that that's really the spirit of this whole endeavor. So I, I'm pleased that you'll be able to join us for, for that. Uh, yes, we're looking forward to that. Yeah. The, the time, of course, is an important one because it's where these things coincide the most. So uh, very timely this evening and, uh, and we'll be continuing conversation and definitely encourage everyone here from both communities to, um, to come and to learn and to share as much as we can because it benefits all of us. So thank you for, for joining us this evening. Thank you especially to Father Richard for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good to see the Maya scarves. Have a... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we'll be able to do it all soon in person. Some more Bible study together would be really lovely, especially Absolutely. over, yeah. over uh, tea. So thank you guys very much and uh, have a great night. Good night all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.